Hello and welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. This is the 24th program on the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 12 of Revelation. We're going to be looking at verses 7 to 17. Now, it's titled, Satan is thrown down to the earth. Satan thrown down to the earth. Wow. Um, this is a little bit of a problematic passage for me. There's a part of it that I don't quite get. And I'm going to tell you about it when I get there. And the reason I decided to start this off, this program this way, is because we don't always understand everything that we find in Scripture. And it's better to admit it than not. Uh, <clears throat> I may understand this in a few years from now, maybe tomorrow. Maybe I might grab it right in the middle of this program, and that's happened to me a few times. I've entered a program talking about it and not known what I'm going to say about something, and then sort of get something, not really always sure I got it right. But that's the nature of Bible interpretation and understanding the Scripture. We don't always get it. We grow in our understanding. But we don't always have to have it right. We don't have to have an answer for everything. Certain groups, cultic groups we call them, they've got to have an answer for everything. And they'll have a lot of literature and they'll look it up and know, oh, this is what it means. But generally, we don't get everything. And we don't have to. Um, our relationship with Christ and our salvation has nothing to do with knowing everything about the Scripture. Some of it is yet to be revealed. Let me tell you, we understand a little bit at a time. We see through a glass darkly, as Paul uh, once said. All right. Now, <clears throat> the title is this, The Satan Thrown Down to Earth. And this is actually telling the same exact story as the first six verses, exact, although it's not exact, it has a little bit more of an idea about it. But the theme of it is the victory of Christ and the victory of the cross. So, this is a restatement. You find this all the time through, through the book of Revelation. John is saying the same thing over and over again. Um, so, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a very interesting little, little theme. Um, one of the, uh, the first hymn books that Christians, um, the Christian community produced called the Odes of Solomon, Solemn for all, Solomon for whatever reason, the 22nd Psalm uh, hymn in that, um, we have Jesus speaking of his triumph over death, and he addresses God as the one who, quote, that overthrew by my hands the dragon with seven heads, and thou hast set me over his roots that I might destroy his seed. So, an ancient Christian hymn. Yeah, Christians have been doing hymn books for a long time. All right, let's get into the passage now. Revelation 12, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Now, this has every appearance of talking about the demonic rebel rebellion against God that took place in heaven, either prior to the creation of the universe or, like many people think, after the creation of the universe, which is my point of view. And it took place there. There was a rebellion. It is beyond our understanding. How could God create an angel and a bunch of angels, myriads of angels, who had the capacity to rebel against him? No Christian has ever resolved that, that, uh, that conflict. I don't even pretend to, but I'm not afraid to bring it up because it exists. But this is what's being spoken of here. 
Now, we might have a fuller understanding later on when we are in the presence of God and understanding this. Maybe this is something so incredibly out of this world, out of this universe, that these words are about the best you can do. And I have a feeling it approaches that idea. What happened could not be put into words so that we, fallen as we are, or even with full capacity like Adam and Eve originally had, maybe couldn't understand it anyway. I think it's something beyond our capacity. But not forever. I think that in the kingdom of heaven, we will understand. But right now, it seems very strange to us. Verse 9, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now that sounds like the biblical picture, doesn't it, of Satan being cast out of heaven. Now, there's going to be a little bit of a problem with that in a minute, um, and it will make sense what I said at the early part of the program. But let me talk about the great dragon thrown down. Ancient serpent. It's speaking, of course, of the serpent in the Garden of Eden that we find in Genesis chapter 3. He's called the devil and Satan. Now, the word devil is from the Greek word diablos. Dia means through, and bolo really is the word, we got our word ball from, thrown through it means. And it has the idea of being a slanderer. A slanderer, someone who slanders, who is vicious in attacking and accusing people. Satan is from the Hebrew has satan, uh, the Hebrew, which means accuser, it means adversary, one who stands against, and that's the way Satan is pictured. Remember, he was the one ready to devour the male child that the woman was going to be giving birth to. Uh, Satan is also pictured as a murderer, a liar, and a deceiver, an accuser. Um, I find in my, in my long pastoral ministry that my favorite way of referring to Satan is he is accuser. Uh, you're no good. Uh, you're, you're beyond hope. Uh, you've broken all of God's laws. You can never be forgiven. You're hopeless. You might as well kill yourself. Uh, nobody likes you. You've lost it. You've messed up your entire life. You have no hope. Give it up. You, you're just going to be in hell forever. He's the accuser. He will bring up to us all of the stupid things we've ever done in our life. And, you know, if anybody would really be truthful, if I were to be truthful with you, if you were to be truthful with someone else, and you would tell them, all the things that you've done or wanted to do or thought about it, why, you'd be there for a long time and it would be horrific. We're, we're a bit of a piece of work. I am. And, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty ugly. It's pretty ugly. And Satan likes to accuse us because he knows. I like to say that Satan has the second best computer in the universe. He knows. He knows. Unhappily. And he uses it against us to tell us that we're no good. You know, one of the chief aspects of any kind of satanic or pagan um, initiation People actually will dedicate themselves to the devil or the demons or some pagan deity, god or goddess of whatever nature, and forswear their belonging to God at all, consign themselves 
to the nether regions. It's part of an initiation. And then Satan uses it against you and says, you're too bad, God. You, you, you're going to rot. You can never go back. I've faced that with many people, especially in my days in the Jesus movement, in my ministry in the Haight-Ashbury, and the satanic cults that came around during that period. People going through such horrific initiations that they figured, I am too awful, I am too bad, I could never be loved or forgiven by God. And that is a complete lie, because Satan is an accuser. There is nothing any human being could ever do in the face of their life and on this planet that can separate us and make it impossible for God to forgive us and love us. It's absolutely impossible. There is the unforgivable sin, and that is a complete and rejection of Jesus from day one to day, the last moment of our life. The accuser, that's what Satan is. The deceiver of the whole world deceives us. Where am I at? Okay. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So it's a recapitulation. In my mind, it's talking about Satan being cast out of heaven at, the, at that initial rebellion against God. Okay. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now here's the confusing part. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren had Brothers has been cast down who accuses them day and night before God. Wait a minute. How can he move such a gigantic leap here? The only way I resolve this, in this third time where he talks about him being cast down from heaven, he's talking about Satan's defeat at the cross. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And that took place on the cross. Now really think about the cross for a minute. Jesus is crucified at 9 a.m., the time of the morning prayer at the temple. At noon, the sky darkened. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We believe that God the Father placed all of our sin upon God the Son at the cross, and he took our sin, his blood was shed, and cleansed us from our sin. And for three hours, the sky was black. And at 3 p.m., Jesus died, breathed his last, and said, it is finished. And I think that's what this is talking about here, this time of Satan being cast down. It's, it's not the first. It's not the initial rebellion. That's my view. That's how, how I reconcile this, that all of a sudden we have all of history just telescoped from the initial rebellion, of initial casting down, to when he was finally destroyed and defeated at the cross all of Satan's effort to prevent Jesus from going to the cross was thwarted. And in last, the last program, I talked about all the ways um, that it looks to be um, for people like myself and many commentators down through the millennia have seen that Satan continually tried to prevent Jesus from going to the cross, but he failed. And finally at the cross... He was finished. He's been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This is my view of it, and the only way I can reconcile these passages to make sense of them. Verse 11, because it goes on. Now look what it says. <clears throat> and they have conquered him. They have, who's the they? That's us. Christians, those who belong to Christ. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. See, right away he's going to the cross. Right away he's going to Jesus, 
the Passover lamb dying on the cross, blood being shed, the nails in the hands, the nails in the feet, the spirit of the side. They've conquered him by the blood of the lamb. How is it that we conquer Satan? By being good people? By living an acceptable life? By helping other people? By learning to become one with the universe? By learning how to focus and concentrate and meditate and whatever kind of tape. That's what we do. It's something that we do. No. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of Christ. It's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's why the cross is a central symbol of Christianity and always will be. The cross is the great altar of God. It's where Jesus Christ, God's priest, sacrifice covers all of our sin. It's an astonishing, astonishing thing. But that is the gospel message. The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony. In other words, they continued to identify with Jesus. They identified with Jesus. They stood up when it was dangerous and deadly to do so, and they stood with Jesus and did not deny him. Jesus said, if, only if you um, take up your cross daily, deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my disciple or you will not be my disciple. And there it is. That is strong evidence of conversion. I remember when I first, with my friends, when I was in the military, not a really good place to do this, but I began to identify myself as a Christian. I was shocked at what followed. Shocked. I'm not going to go into the details. It was really astonishing. I'll never forget it. I still, in my mind, all these years later, I still... I still have that picture in my mind. 52 years ago. Wow. I'm still struck by it. They loved not their lives even under death. Something dramatic has to take place for a person to do that. And that is the power of conversion. That's what happened when you're really born again by the Spirit of God. And only that. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because his nose, that his time is short. Again, this comes down. Satan throws down now. So you have this thrown down at the beginning, the initial rebellion. Then we have another thrown down at the cross, and then after, it refers to it again. He says, Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And this is referring to Satan attacking the church. Remember, the first part of Revelation has to do with the persecution of the church. The second part of Revelation from chapter 12 on focuses now on the satanic attack of the church. And this is what we're looking at here and what we're going to be looking at now for the rest of the book of Revelation. Just keep that in mind. Has come down in great wrath. His time is short. It's been a long time. I, I don't consider the last 2,000 years being short, but from God's time, he views it as short. We have a different point of view on that. Verse 3, 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. This symbolic language, building off of that, that incredible passage in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, and then other passages throughout the Old Testament, things that the prophet said, 
continues that story, pursues the woman. Now the woman is not Eve. It is not the Virgin Mary. But now the woman is the church. The woman is the church. The offspring of the woman. Pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The male child, of course, is Jesus, the Messiah. And the church is all of those who belong to Jesus. Those that are actually born again of the Spirit of God are dwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about here. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle. The great eagle. Uh, let me find the passage about the great eagle. Um, <clears throat> I can't find it here. But it's a passage, I believe, in Deuteronomy somewhere where the children of Israel were like carried into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle. And so we have this picture once again. John and the vision keeps going back to the Old Testament stories, particularly around Moses and the freedom from slavery and coming into the wilderness and into the promised land. It's, the stories just keep on going. That's why you get, you know, some people will, will say, well, I don't need to read the Old Testament. If you don't read the Old Testament, you're not going to understand the New Testament. It's just as simple as that. You too easily get confused because the Old, New Testament is built on the Old Testament. You can't know... The New Testament lets you know the Old Testament. You really can't. Or you can't have the, the fuller, broad picture. <coughs> okay. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, where the church is in the wilderness. Uh, I think I saw a book with that title called The Church in the Wilderness. And the church is in the wilderness. It's, it's a place prepared for us by God, where God brought us, but the wilderness is not our final destination. The promised land is. To, be, to the place where if she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Three and a half. Keeps coming up, that, that three and a half, over and over and over again. Um, uh, the three and a half the th is the thousand years. The three and a half is the millennium, the thousand years. It's a th symbolic number. The three and a half is uh, also the story of a very short period leading up to the battle of Armageddon and leading up to the day of judgment. Three and a half. The period of the years of the church in the wilderness. Okay. And notice it says, to be nourished. To be nourished. It's a great word. Build a tremendous sermon on that little phrase, where she is to, to be nourished for that time. Uh, God so equips the leaders of the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. God equips to nourish to feed, to strengthen. Verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. I think last time I talked about an essay I wanted to write. In fact, I did write it um, yesterday. Uh, called, It's Easier to Be an Atheist. When you look at the confusion, the religious confusion, the political confusion, the cultural confusion, confusion, our world is a mess. It is so, so confusing. No wonder people just want to hide and get away from it all. You know, whatever it takes to numb the pain, to fend off the confusion and all... Uh, uh, the staggering mess that goes on in our world. No wonder I feel it myself. I feel it myself. The flood. 
sent by the, the deceiver, the slanderer, the accuser, the deceiver. The flood of the mess. The conflicting worldviews that we experience globally and locally. We experience it all. And it's horrendous to sweep us away, to confuse us, to mess up our minds, to, to just destroy us in our inner being. Verse 16, but the earth came to the help of the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. I don't exactly know what that means, but the only thing it really means to me is in ways that we don't understand, even in the natural process of things in the world, the rise and fall of the nations, the coming and going of the great leaders and heroes, and the great armies, the great movements, all of the advancement of art and science and so on. Somehow, somehow, in that there is a certain preservation, there is a way that God works to preserve and protect and to nourish. I don't know how to say it much more than that. So, the earth came to the help of the woman. Verse 17, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. You see, it goes back to that Genesis 3.15 time and again. So it talks about, in my mind, it looks like what's happening is Satan missed his chance there in Israel in the first century during the life of Jesus. He missed his chance. He tried to prevent the cross. He failed at that. There was the crucifixion. There was the resurrection. There was the ascension. Now he goes to make war on the rest of the saints. The rest of her offspring after the church. And it says, it amplifies on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Now, <clears throat> this is the dragon, and we're going to find next time the story of the beast and then the story of the false prophet. It's a sermon I'm actually preaching on this coming Sunday. Wow. This is an incredible study. Sometimes I wish I hadn't started Revelation but then sometimes I am. So long.